Hi everyone and welcome back to The Shack and given the modern world we live in there's every chance that you're watching this episode on your smartphone or tablet and those devices have become a part of everyday life for a significant number of people on the planet. And of course we don't just use them to watch YouTube, we have our email, our contacts, calendars, web browsing and apps of all kinds for both business and pleasure. If you have an Apple device, you're no doubt using Siri to some extent to help organise your life and make things easier, or Cortana in the Microsoft camp and Google Assistant, which is the, uh, well, Google Assistant. The idea of an electronic personal digital assistant isn't new, and there have been some real hit and misses along the way. But back in 1997, one company got it right by making an absolute blinder. So join me as we discover the Scion Series 5. Here at The Shack, we'd like to give a huge thank you to the sponsor for this video, PCB Way. They help us out with all of our PCB fabrication needs and make fantastic boards at amazingly competitive prices. And it's not only PCBs that are on the menu. Apart from other fabrication services like CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication and injection molding, PCB Way also have a great projects library of cool stuff to build from people all around the world. Oh, and if you don't like waving a soldering iron about, they can even assemble your PCBs for you. That's the PCB way. Right, on with the show. So before we look at the Series 5 and its newer, more powerful sibling, the 5MX, we need to go back in time a little further because the name Scion might be familiar to you even if you never owned a single PDA in your life. But perhaps you had a ZX Spectrum when you were a wee nipper. If so, then you'll remember Scion being plastered over many Sinclair Spectrum and ZX81 games back in the early 80s, including Flight Simulation, Checkered Flag, Chess and a certain character that was both hungry and enjoyed skiing. You'll also have seen the name on the welcome tape for the Spectrum. Was this the same Scion? Well, yes it was, and they didn't just do games for Sinclair, they also published business and productivity software such as ViewCalc, a spreadsheet, ViewFile, a database and View3D, a 3D modelling and rendering package, all for the humble Specky. Scion was founded in 1980 and the name is an acronym of Potter Scientific Instruments after the company's founder David Potter with ON added on the end because PSI was already in use as a company name. Acknowledging the success of their collaboration with Sinclair and the numerous ports of their software to other platforms, when Sinclair reached out again to Scion in 1983 to develop a suite of business applications for their new QL business machine, Scion saw the opportunity and were on board to furnish the QL with its own suite of launch business titles. Quill, a word processor, Archive, a database, Abacus, a spreadsheet and easel for charts and other businessy type graphics. Now, as you may know, the QL itself wasn't a fantastic success, but the quality of the Scion software wasn't in question and the company clearly had the chops to handle the business software side of things. In rolls 1984 and Scion released their first piece of hardware, the Scion Organizer, which was a quirky looking device with a 6x6 matrix keyboard arranged alphabetically rather than QWERTY or AZERTY, presumably because this would attract non-computer owners because, well, back in 1980 I guess, most people were more familiar with the alphabet than with a typewriter keyboard. Short-sighted? Not really. Did it work? Well, I guess so, because they kept it for the sequel. Oh, and this product was marketed as the world's first practical pocket computer, which of course it wasn't. That sequel was the Organizer 2, which followed two years later in 1986. And even though, as I mentioned, it kept the odd keyboard, it dramatically improved on its predecessor in almost every way. And it needed to because it was going up against the increasingly popular Filofax. Yeah, 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 let's lunch. The Organizer 2 also saw the first user accessible implementation of Scion's 
Organizer Programming Language, or OPL, which really did make it a computer in your pocket. The machine was hugely successful, being used by one of the UK's biggest retail chains, Marks & Spencer, where it lived on the shop floor and was used for price checks, stock takes, and was really quite ahead of its time. Surveyors used them out in the field, and over 3,000 of them were also used within the UK government to help the employment services figure out benefit calculations. A lot of this flexibility was down to the organiser too having an external device slot which could be populated with all sorts of fancy gizmos. By 1986 though, homes, schools and offices around the country and indeed the world had seen computers become quite commonplace and a new design was needed. And that next jump took a while to develop, with the result being the Scion Series 3, released in 1991, followed by the 3A in 93, the 3C in 96, and the 3MX in 98. The Series 3 was a massive step forward in being a truly useful day-to-day -day personal digital assistant, with an extensive range of business apps, and through an optional modem, it could also connect to the internet. Over the course of its life, many upgrades were made to the device, including faster processors, a bigger screen introduced in the 3A revision, I.O. ports, more memory, and by the time it reached the end of its incredibly successful life, there was only really one major thing that held it back from being perfect, the keyboard. So in 1997, Scion released the Series 5, and it was a game changer. Let's take a look at just why this device was so loved and so far ahead of the game at the time. Let's imagine that it's 1997 and this may be what I'm used to working with. My home PC setup might look like this. If I had a laptop, it might look like this. And if I was lucky enough to have an ultra portable, it may have looked like this. So that's my landscape when I receive this. This 8 megabyte Series 5 would have cost me £499, and if your needs weren't as strong or your pockets quite so deep, there was a 4 megabyte version available for £439. There are boasts on the front of PC synchronization, office compatibility, printing, and also email, fax, and web browsing, which I remember at the time feeling like witchcraft. Got a mention here of a backlit screen, although this feature massively affects the battery life. And on the side of the box, we've got a bit of upselling going on here by showing the 10 meg storage card. What, you mean you didn't buy one? And moving to the back of the box, we get our first glimpse at what this little machine can do. And there are some lovely clear screenshots to whet our appetites. Spinning the box over, there are the all important specifications where we discover that at the heart of this machine is a 32-bit RISC-based ARM 7100 processor running at 18 megahertz. Rather interesting wording with the full VGA width touch sensitive screen, it's actually 640 by 240 pixels, so whilst it's full width, it's only half the height of full VGA, although it does support 16 shades of grey. Uh, we're up to 50 these days if Mrs. RetroShack is to be believed. It's powered by two AA batteries, which it states here is about a month of typical usage, typical therefore being about an hour a day. Both RS-232 and IRDA or infrared serial connections are provided, along with a speaker and microphone, meaning it can be used for dictation as well as playing music. Inside we've got our quick start guide, which is basically about putting in the batteries, switching on and showing us where the control panel is. Here's our PC link cable so we can connect to our home PC. And look, this is before the days of 50 billion websites dedicated to how to cook a chicken. So the machine also comes with this amazing handbook that shows us actually how to use the thing, including a full programming guide. Scion's SciWin software is supplied on CD to help transfer files and now we come to the first in our feature presentations, this lovely, almost as new Series 5. And I've got to admit to getting the same sense of wonder and excitement at seeing this as I did first time around over 25 years ago. It's a masterpiece of engineering. The stylus is a proper size, not some fiddly three inch piece of plastic, and it tucks away completely inside the unit. Even Apple can't do that and have to rely on magnets to stick their pen to an iPad. 
The form factor is still pleasingly small, and even though those pesky modern mobile phones are much more powerful, and of course have an inexhaustible supply of software almost instantly available, this machine has a certain charm that almost transcends time. The keyboard is almost TARDIS-like in that when the machine is open and you're typing away, you wonder how it all fits inside the case. These are proper laptop-like keys with a good amount of travel, and even someone relatively sausage-fingered like me can touch type on this. Right, let's pop some fresh batteries in and switch this little beauty on. Turning on the Series 5, we're informed that the backup battery needs replacing, and we'll go over why that's important later, along with ways to minimise the impact of batteries running out. The screen's a little dim, so we'll go into the control panel to sort that out. My pudgy fingers aren't well suited to the touchscreen, which is why they give you a stylus, I suppose. We'll whack the contrast up a bit, and I must say that it's much clearer in real life than it looks on camera. This is a capacitive touchscreen with a very slow refresh LCD, all to maximise battery life, but it is a bit jarring when we've become used to more modern displays. With the contrast looking good, at least to me in real life, and the calibration complete, let's pop into Word and see if the keyboard feels as good as I remember. And actually, yes it does. It's amazing how good this keyboard is today, let alone for a device that's over a quarter of a century old. It does feel like a laptop keyboard, and it definitely feels bigger than it is, and all of the keys are clear and laid out very sensibly. In Scion's spreadsheet app called Sheet, everything is very Excel-like, and most of the core functions that you have in Excel follow the same or very similar syntax here, so balancing the books whilst on the train would be a doddle. The Data app is essentially a non-relational database that's initially set up for contacts, but could be amended to store your collection of beanie babies, if that's your thing, by customising the fields. Agenda is your standard diary app to manage your appointments, and the time app, well, it tells you the time, but you can set up multiple clocks, New York and Peckham, for example. Oh, and of course, alarms. We all love alarms. The calculator app is just that, but it does have both standard and scientific modes for you clever types. Sketch will allow your artistic juices to flow, but it's very basic compared to modern tools. A sprite or procreate, it isn't. It does come with some clip art and some text box type functionality, so I guess it has its uses. There are some extra apps as well, including Spell, which is a spell checker and thesaurus, and also has an anagram mode to help you solve those, and also a crossword helper so you can leave the completed times crossword on your seat and look all intelligent like. There's an inbuilt programming environment for OPL, so technically, if you need to do something on this device that isn't built in, you could code it yourself if you're that way inclined, and indeed, many, many people did as there's a substantial amount of freeware and shareware available. All of the modem and infrared configuration can be changed to map to your particular PC or phone to get you online or linked up to your desktop. And even though it's built in, if anyone asks you if they can use your dictaphone, just tell them to use their finger like everyone else. I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> Lastly, for some reason, Scion also gave you their equivalent of Minesweeper to play, which is one of the most frustratingly annoying games they could ever have chosen. So that's the Series 5, and it's an amazing little machine. I mean, I'm not sure that I could recommend this device over a more modern ultra portable like a MacBook Air, but if you're completely off grid and want something that can run off a big pack of AA batteries for six months whilst you're writing your magnum opus, then I guess this would be ideal. But Scion didn't rest on their laurels, and in 1999, just as we were all about to die from the millennium bug, with planes falling out of the sky and society crumbling all around us, Scion brought out the 5MX. Could they improve upon near perfection? Well, yes and no. The 5MX wasn't the quantum leap over the 5 in the same way that the 3A was over the original 3, or the 3 over the Organizer 2 for that matter, but it did have some nice improvements and a refocus of some of the apps to embrace an increasingly internet-aware world. 
It also had double the memory at 16 megabytes, and even though it had the same CPU, it now ran at 36 megahertz, double the speed of its predecessor, which made for a much snappier feel. It was the same size and shape, and almost exactly the same weight, but its internals were completely different. It was a total redesign in fact, but you wouldn't really know it to look at it. The app shortcut bar at the bottom of the screen has changed slightly to introduce a couple of new ones, relegating others to the extras section. We've got the addition of Jotter for ad hoc notes with embedded sketches, think notepad and paint combined. The data app has been renamed as contacts as that's mostly what people used it for, although data is still there but it's now called database and is still pretty basic. The 5MX finally gets an email app, although again it's not exactly feature rich, but then your brain will quite wrongly tell you that only 5 people had email back in 99 anyway. And they kept that flaming minesweep again too. Arr! So the only thing left is what to do about batteries and losing information. You've got a backup battery to keep things in memory while you change the main batteries, but if you're in the middle of nowhere, eventually you'll run out of juice and lose the lot. Well, this is where those memory cards come in, such as this 16 megabyte card here. Anything stored on these isn't dependent on battery power, so as long as you save copies of your work to one of these, you'll not end up screaming and throwing your Scion into a river. To show this, let's pop this one into the device and then load a file I know is on there. And et voila, my magnificent octopus is safe. If you get the chance to get hold of one of these, they're a great little machine to carry around and there's a huge amount of software out there to play with. We've only scratched the surface in this video, so please do go off and explore to see what these machines can do. I'm off to see if I can download the Spectrum emulator for this 5MX and then I can play some retro games on an emulator on a retro device because that stuff makes me happy. I hope you've enjoyed this little look at Scion and the fabulous Series 5. If you like the video please give us a thumbs up and please don't forget to subscribe to see more of this sort of nonsense in the future. Take care everyone and until next time in the shack, it's goodbye from me.